I asked Eddie Hearn for some tickets to the show. He went, yeah, you can have two tickets. I thought, and Josh was fighting. So I went down to the show and he put me on the, on the top tier at the back of the arena, three rows from the very back of his seat in the arena. And I wow. thought, people were talking to me going, are you John Murray? And I was that embarrassed. I was like, nah. A massive welcome to my next guest and as I said to him just someone I have admired for so so long um, watched him on the TV many times absolute warrior warrior of a man um, Mr John Murray John how are you doing you well my friend yes very well thanks for having me honestly the pleasure is all mine no doubt about it no doubt about it at all now we do things a little bit differently here um than probably some of the interviews that you've done previously and really looking into uh, the fighter himself what makes him tick um maybe he's learned some lessons from the past um and you know kind of inspire the youth which is one of the main things that we do here so starting really from the very very beginning um what got you into boxing john it started off just like me and my brothers just, just having toy boxing matches in the back room and stuff, watching Rocky and acting out the films and stuff. Uh, but it, it inspired us for, for, like, to go to the gym as we got a bit older. We lived on a lot of rough estates growing up, so it was um, we had to deal with bullies and stuff, you know what I mean? It was three boys, and with me being the eldest boy, it, it was always me that got sent out, you know what I mean, to look after my brothers and that. So my mum decided to get us into boxing, you know, so we have to handle ourselves a little bit better. And um, it just progressed from there. So I started when I was about nine in an actual gym. And it was good. I enjoyed it. But then, as, as kids do, you find other hobbies and stuff. So I went away from it. But then uh, I broke my arm when I was 14, I think. And um, they said to you, just do everything you normally do now. I've cut the cast off and, and get... get um, get it back strong and I remember the day I had my cast cut off I had a fight in school that day actually someone had kicked, kicked my little brother Joe in the nuts so well, I the, went the, the day me. after you took your cast off the day I, day I had my cast cut off my arm I was in school my Joe, Joe was only in year 7 I was in year yeah. 9 and uh, what, a lad out of my year booted him in the nuts and uh, I went <laughs> tell me you've done that now and he went him over there and went you just kicked my brother in the nuts <laughs> and I cracked it I cracked him with it with my right arm where the one was broken but the fight was over. There's only one shot, and they're done with with, with me. And uh, but I decided to go to a boxing gym after that. I wanted to go to boxing. I thought, you know, I, I was quite handy. I had lots of fights growing up, and that. it seemed like I was fighting every every couple of weeks as kids. And uh, and obviously having two brothers as well. All we did all day, every day. Like our, our idea was fun, just toy fighting. So we we just uh, were very very competitive. Me and my brothers. So. We wanted that um, physical challenge and that, and boxing just seen a natural progression for us. So we went to um, Shannon Shannon ABC is where we started, and I went down with my cousin um, after that fight in school. I thought I'm gonna go and do check up some boxing, and I went down to Shannon's, and uh, it was an instant addiction for me. I loved it. I loved it. I loved the hard graft. I loved the smell of the gym when I walked in. <laughs> um, I just was hooked instantly and I thought, you know, this is big. And it just sort of started from there. And then uh, my coach at the time was John Phelan. And uh, he got me into boxing. And I remember I had my first amateur fight. And I won. I won in round two. But then my second amateur fight, I got knocked out. But I got put flat on my back. And I remember uh, no one really knew I do do boxing at this point. I remember going to see my dad in the pub and... Uh, the next day, as he said, I've been doing a bit of boxing and that. He goes, I've yeah. been doing a bit of boxing, son. How are you getting on? I said, I had a fight last night. I got knocked out. Oh, no. And him and all his mates were laughing at me. And I thought, I'm never going to let you guys ever laugh at me again. <laughs> and it made me so determined and so, like, a bit psychopathic about my training. Because I, I, the way yeah. my mentality was, if you're the fittest and you're the strongest, then how can you get beat? And it's, it's the right mentality to have in boxing. Because usually yeah. the fittest win the fight and I beat fighters that were far superior to me boxing ability wise but I was just so fit so tenacious so tough I could drag him into a fight and okay. drag him into deep water and beat him with my fitness and um, my first season as an amateur so after I got knocked out my second fight then Joe Gallagher joined the gym and he had, he had he'd come from Louisville like to Shannon's and he'd set up a new amateur boxing club and my trainer, John John Phelan, said, John, I think you should go and train with Joe because I think Joe's a better coach than me. And 
you know, he's, he's big respect that to John because I, John had me from the start and he'd done a lot for me, but he, he saw my potential and he thought, I think Joe will do a better job with your uh, bringing you on. And he, he was he was he was correct. Um, I think in the first season as an amateur, then I went on to win eight fights on the trot. I'd gone to, I went to the national final in the schoolboys in the first like it was the last year, last last year at school when I started the schoolboys. Okay. I went into, I went in Manchester champion, Northwest champion, Midlands champion, and I boxed a kid called James Barker down London in the, in the schoolboy final. But I made it all the way to the final in the in the first year of boxing and. Uh, James Richardson, he was called. Sorry, James Richardson, and uh, I, uh, I, the first time we was fighting, I don't know if you heard about that show in, in Bar, was it Barker Barking, and and halfway through the final, the, the, the curtains come down. There was, cr- there was crowd writing, but I'm sure I would have won the final that day. Anyway, he was like he was England number one. He had over 60, 70 fights. I was on him in like my ninth, eighth, ninth fight, and he, he'd obviously just took it a bit easy and thought he was going to win easy, but. Um, I was winning the fight. I dragged him into a bit of a scrap, and I was going through him. But the the fight got called off halfway through the second round, and then we end up having a rematch in the Midlands to to decide who's going to be schoolboy champion. And he, he smoked me the second time. He came prepared. <laughs> he knew what he was coming up to. But all learning experiences, and um, I think the fight after that, I boxed for England. Then I think I boxed a kid from South Africa. He would did. Uh, I think he was like forty nine fights, but. I think he was on some like mad winning streak where he'd not lost a fight in like I'm, I, I could I could be wrong, but I'm sure he hasn't lost any fights. So that's what Joe Gallagher told me anyway. So I don't know, he had like ten fights. <laughs> was he just trying to psych you up him. at this point or Yeah, that's what he used to do. He was dead good at it to be fair. He motivate you yeah, for yeah. fear God is he be make, nervous, makes but... me laugh that to be honest, John. I used to do a similar kind of thing in the amateurs with my best mate and um, I used to be like, I used to make stories up, try and piss him off. <laughs> I used to say, yeah, you should have heard what he's just said about you, mate. And he'd be like, what? What's yeah. he said? He said he's going to go smash you up. Like, and he's, he's like, fucking said it's what? Perfect. said what, it's, did it's he? perfect for getting you motivated, yeah. <laughs> Whatever you need to do to get you motivated, that's what works. And uh, <laughs> I was I was like, I was, I was doing well then. I've, I went to next year, I went to the um, junior ABAs. Again, I got to the national final. And I boxed Gary Sykes uh, in the final. And I... I, I I boxed Gary, Gary Sykes twice as an amateur, and both times he beat me on count back nine all right. Oh no way! And and the second the second time I boxed him in the junior NBA final, I I, I mean he said at the time he thinks I won both fights, but I thought I won both fights. So the second time when I boxed him in junior NBA, junior NBA final, and I knocked him down with a left hook in the second round, I gave him a standing count in the fourth round, and then he got his hand raised. I was like, what did he have to do to win a fight? But <laughs> I think my style was always more suited to the pros. Yeah. I went to uh, the in the ABAs the next year, and I lost to England number one. Uh, I think it was called Stephen Burke at the time, and uh, again another fight that I fought. I won. I think he finished the fight, and I'd, his eye was closed, um, and he couldn't go on to the next round. Then, but I was out in the tournament, and it annoyed me that. But um, I thought Saturday I'm going pro, so when I turned pro, then I was the youngest pro in the country. I was 18 years old when I turned pro, and I was the youngest pro in the country. And, I had no promoter or nothing like that. I'd only had 24 amateur fights. And I think I had 24 amateur fights, uh, 16 wins and eight knockouts. So it was a relatively short career, three seasons as an amateur. But I was just Incredibly made for the pros. successful, though, really. Your style is made for the pros. There's not even any yeah. question about that whatsoever. Um, yeah. I've got to ask you a question, really, being from the Manchester area, and I'm sure you've been asked this question before. Now, realistically, whenever you mention Manchester to any fighter or anybody associated with boxing abroad, they always bring the name up, Ricky Hatton. I mean, did you ever have kind of during your, you know, start of your career where people thought, did you have to kind of live up to that, do you feel? Like, kind of, was there a bit of pressure on you to be the next Ricky Hatton? Not so much that you had to live up to it. I think Ricky Ricky Hatton was an inspiration for me. Certainly when I was like um, 16, 17, 18, before I turned pro, he was, he was Ricky Hatton, Michael Gomez, Michael Brody, Anthony Farnell, Jamie Moore. It was all these Manchester Warriors and good fighters. And uh, you just looked up to him and it built Manchester boxing massive. You know, it started off in the velodrome and it was topping the MEN. It was getting bigger and bigger. And it, was, it was drawing all these fans and... Um, Ricky Hatton was, I used to watch, sit there and watch Ricky Hatton's fights and absolutely love it. And Gomez and all them, I like, would sit there, me and my brothers, mm-hmm. 
hooked to it and was glued to the telly, like cheering him on, shouting out the telly, and that was well into it. And uh, if anything, it motivated you. It's uh, if they can do it, you could do it, kind of thing. You know what I mean? They're from Manchester, and we're from Manchester, so we can all do it. And the training in Manchester was was up there, I think. And uh, I think that's why the results were so good. I think we had yeah. some good trainers in Manchester. With Brian Hughes, Billy Graham, um, Oliver Harrison, stuff like people like that, and mm-hmm. the old school boxing trainers. You know what I mean? And and it just it sort of spiraled from there. And, and then you had the new school with Joe Gallagher coming through, and there's a lot of a lot of other good trainers now in Manchester. And Pat Barrett's doing a top job down Collier's and Moston. It's just it's just. It just all started getting bigger and bigger, and I think Manchester, I think Manchester boxing now is still booming. Got yeah, some absolutely. young lights coming through, and it's it's doing well. But I'd, uh, I'd I do what I do I do want to get back involved with the boxing a little bit. I mean, I've got my gym in that. I've trained my amateurs. Um, I did I had a little play at the pros for a couple of years. I, go, I had a couple of pros, I had some success, but. Uh, I might start trying me under it again now. I'm in a good place at the minute mentally and you, I'm building my business back up so it's good to get back involved and give something back, I think. I love that. I absolutely love that. And it's not been easy for you, has it? You know, and I want to touch on that because, um, you know, boxing is such a cruel, lonely sport. Um, and really, what I want to touch on with you a little bit later on is, you know, after boxing and, and how that affected you. And I, I'm definitely with you on it as well. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk to you that a little bit, little bit later on. Um, as a fighter, though, you were a big, big puncher. Um, you had 20, 20 knockouts, um, which is huge, really, for a lightweight. So where do you feel kind of that come from? Do you feel it was... Uh, natural? Uh, is there anything particularly that you worked on for this? Or uh, tell us about that. I just try. I treat every fight me like a fight. I wasn't planning on going the distance. It was a fight for me, and obviously, I grew up a lot fighting a lot outside, growing up in some tougher states and that. And the idea was to hit them before they hit you, and just don't stop hitting till the job's done. And, and pretty much, my style sort of. Was a bit like that. I just go yeah. boom, 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 and I try and knock him out. You know what I mean? I was it. I was trying to knock him out, going the distance. It wasn't really what I was. I wasn't planning on going the distance. You know what I mean? I was. I was trying to knock you out every second of every round because that was just a for me. It was a fight, and that's what I did in the fight. You got to get the fight over with. You know what I mean? So I just went out, head and head. You hit me, I hit you. Last man standing. Let's have it. Bing, 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 and that sort of sort of how I used to fight. I used to treat it like it was a fight, but then. Once the fight's over, you shake hands and that's it. Back to being friends, and it? it's weird boxing. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it is the weirdest thing in the world. I mean, back it's weird, in the day, I mean, it's a long time since I've been in the ring. But when I did, I got I can remember caving someone's head in and getting my cave my head caved in at the same time. Yeah, I see him in the street these days, and I'm shaking the around like they're my best pal, like more than my best yeah, pal. It's, it's like, it's like me, family. It's it's me, it's me, but when you fight someone, you bear your soul a little bit, and you get a feel for what other person's about. Like yeah. You earn each respect. It's not giving in boxing, it's earning it. And uh, yeah, yeah. I remember going to the gym and the amateurs and that, and uh, I had to work my respects off, off a few kids, a few tough kids in there and that. And you have to get in the ring and you have a spa with them. You get might get beat up a bit, but you keep coming back and you earn the respects in the end. And I think that's a, it's a good life lesson in boxing. I, you know, I talk about bringing boxing back into high schools and stuff, and I think, if they yeah. did so, I think it would sort out a lot, a lot of problems in, with it, with, the, with what's going on, like knife crime and stuff like that. I just think it just sorts everything out. It's sort of like if you get in the ring and you test each other, people respect each other a lot yeah. more. I mean, when you go into a boxing gym, you've got people of all different like classes, all different yeah, and money making, you know, all that kind of thing, all different levels of community. But they're all just like like a big massive family. It's yeah. it's weird boxing gym, Strange, but just the most respects and everyone helps everyone. It's a good place. It is, it is, and I mean, even if you I, I, I give you another another story. Uh, me and my my best pal were going on holiday, and we noticed uh, a guy with a uh, something boxing club on the back. So we were all over it. We were like, "Which club are you from? You know, who'd you look after?" And he, I think he was um, a Tommy Coyle, somebody with Tommy Coyle, if I remember, oh, remember rightly. Yeah. And just and we just get talking for for hours about about fights yeah. and about fighters. So yeah, it's uh, you just can't stop us, can you? When we when we start, absolutely. Start. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Definitely. Now, one thing that's plagued you um, 
realistically your entire career um and still does to this day is your eyes um and during your eyes i've I read some stories and I, I looked at some videos um where you're talking about valcro catching your eyes um just for the people out there some people watch the show don't always know about boxing and we'd like to teach them a little bit about what actually goes on tell us about the journey of what's happened with your eyes yeah so i am i am currently blind in this i'm a right eye i'm blind um Detached retina in my last fight against Anthony Crawler. I mean, I was having problems with my eye ever since the Mitchell loss. I had nerve damage, so I had like double vision uh -huh. right. And it was, I think it was hanging on by a thread, but obviously I kept going. I kept I kept getting told I'm not far off from making life changing when I worked so many years to get there. But right. realistically, once you start messing around with your eyes, if there's any sort of damage, really should knock it on the head. Looking back, you know what I mean. But I was a boy back then. You don't, you don't really understand. You just, you've got people around you, your trainer, your manager, your promoter. They're all saying, "Keep going, keep going." And uh, this is a bit about boxing. What I don't like, if I'm honest, because like the thing about boxing is, you are the commodities for the business, and um, mm -hmm. you, there's no business without a fighter. But the the fighters are on a consistent conveyor belt of of other fighters all coming behind. So the promoters, the managers, the trainers, they're always getting paid because they've always got a new fighter. Whereas the fighter only gets paid when he fights. And then once he's done, even though he's the business, that's him done. There's a new line of fighters coming through. So all the people involved with working boxing are always getting paid, but the fighter doesn't get paid after he finishes boxing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think there's these, these uh, it's not right. Something's not quite right about the boxing game because I speak to a lot of ex-pros, big, big fighters, and they're all the same. They've all got this bitter taste in the mouth. And I've been, I've been yeah, speaking absolutely. to people quite a lot at the minute, and uh, he talks about, he says, we're, we're, like, we're basically like prostitutes. You know, we get used mm -hmm. like prostitutes, and once we're done, we're done. Yeah. And you know, off you go. And I remember when I lost my well, I lost my eyesight in my, in my right eye, and I knew I couldn't fight anymore. It was like the phone dropped dead for me instantly. It yeah. was like... Before then, going into fights, and I was like, "Hi, John, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Is everything okay? How's training going? Just mm. checking up on you and all that." And it was like, "Once I was right, it's like, bang, he's done now. Next one." And yeah. I don't, most of the people from boxing, um, I don't speak to anyone anymore. Yeah, I don't get calls anymore. I don't keep in touch anymore. It's just weird how you just dropped and abandoned, and one minute you're a star of the show, and the next minute you just fucked right off. And it's it is. It does leave a bit of taste in boxers' mouths. I mean, there is people out there that do a bit of boxing, but he's he's not enough done. Uh, considering if you want to be a high class professional boxer, you've got to start from like I, I knew I was going to be pro from 14, 15 years old. Yeah, and I had to work every day, and I didn't really put anything else in place apart from I was going to be a boxer. I went to college for a year, I went to a box academy a year after that, but then I knew I was going to be pro, so I wasn't really thinking of anything other than being yeah, there's a pro. there's no plan B, is there? There's no plan B no, for so many yeah, players. Yeah, I to pro, yeah. And uh, I turned pro 18, and the idea was I'll, I'll fight until I get beat. Once I get beat, I'll go and get a job like everyone else. But I didn't get beat until I was 31. Do you know what I mean? And then, and then I got beat, and then in a couple more years, I think I retired when I was about 30. What was it, 30? I don't know, 30. I didn't get beat until I was 29, and I retired at 31, 32, didn't I? But it was like when I retired, I was like a 32 year old school leaver. I had no, yeah. no guidance, no, didn't know what to do. And when you're a pro, you're told what to get up, where to run, how long to run, what to eat, what to do. You just, your life's all structured. Yeah. And, and once you retire from boxing, you're just like, right, go on now. You're a grown man. Off you go into the, into the big wide world. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a problem with boxers. I don't think a lot of boxers know how to deal with that, with their life being so structured for so long and then they're thrown out into the big wide world they don't they yeah. don't a lot of fighters really really struggle after after boxing i've seen it time and time again it's yeah. like it's if 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 you compare it to like people that are in jail they're in jail if you serve a longer long amount of time they don't just go right you set up now off you go put out you go into the big wide world because they won't be able to adapt to it where yeah. They start having like home leave visits when the sentence comes to an end to get them used to being back out in the in the in the real world. They start having like um, the training programs so they can get a job for when they leave and stuff. Yeah, and teach yeah. certain things. And maybe there needs to be something like that in boxing because it's a tough time after you retire. I mean, 
I was lucky in, in a way because I I lost to Rios. Then I was due to fight Gavin Reese a, a, a year after. Mm-hmm. I got myself into t- top shape. And then a week before the Gavin Reese fight, um, I get a phone call saying the fight's off because I failed a brain scan. So um, it ended up keeping me out of the ring for another year. But I had to get used to what life was like after boxing. It gave me a taste of what it was like. And I, skin, I started doing some work on the road with a mate of mine who sorted me out a job. And it was just, it was hard. It was a tough time in my life, but yeah. I was lucky enough to get a second chance. And um, because if that was it, I never boxed again. I was, I would have been knackered. Do you know no what? savings. I, I never spoke to anybody who's actually had and admitted what you've said there. Yeah. Um, and I know exactly how you feel. I know it yeah. sounds stupid. I, I actually, I normally say I, I can appreciate how you feel, but I actually mm. do understand how you feel now. What not, I don't really talk about it very much, but when I'm not doing boxing, well, I used to be a singer. Uh, me and my wife <laughs> sang, and we, we sang on TV, and um, we went oh. to, I went on on the X Factor, and we did really well, and we got yeah. beat by Robbie and and all this. This is this is I've always done this. I've always been involved in boxing, but um, I will Google it after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they still see it. And um, yeah. I went from singing on, on Wembley at Wembley. Um, with thousands and thousands and thousands of people screaming, you know, signing autographs to the next day going work at six in the morning, nobody know, walking past everybody, nobody knowing who I was. And I, mm-hmm. I had to have medication after that because I yeah, went from like ear to like ear so fast. It's and it mad. messed me up, mate. It's exactly the same. It's, uh, we talk about fighters, and, and I think a lot of fighters have PTSD mm-hmm. um, after they finish boxing because they are. Made to feel, I suppose, why you're winning and fighting. You are a bit of a star, and people are stopping you. And it's like it can go from being like, for instance, I'll give you an example. I talked to Bill at the AMA Arena, my last fight against Anthony Crawler. Mm-hmm. Um, three months later, I was blinding one eye, I couldn't fight anymore. Um, I asked Eddie Earn for some tickets to the show. We went, You can have two tickets. I thought I Josh was fighting, so I went down to the show and he put me on, um, on the top tier at the back of the arena, three rows from the very back of his seat in the arena. And I wow. thought, people were talking to me going, are you John Murray? And I was that embarrassed. I was like, nah, I had to get off and even stay for the main event in the end because I was like, fucking hell, three months ago. you a bit closer, was wasn't you, rather than the, the, the three, media Three or months ago, I was in the fucking ring. Three months later, I'm three rows from the back, of, back, back seat in the arena and that is boxing for me. That's how brutal it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> You know, if you're done, you're dusted, and you don't need nothing of you no more. So they don't give you nothing, and yeah. I give a lot of bucks, and I, it cost me an eye. Do you know what I mean? And the amount of fight, the amount of fights. I mean, I dedicate my whole life to it, and and to to be just ripped off and threw away like you're a piece of trash. It's heartbreaking, and it's hard for you to deal with that. And it, it took a long time for me to come to terms with it. Um, I think in the end acceptance was the big part for me. I just accepted what had happened, accepted what I'd done, and I'd, and it helped me move forward. I mean, I've, I was like, well, I, was, I was talking about that before when I had that taste of uh, what boxing would like when I filmed a brain scan. Yeah, if with I, a couple of years if, out whilst yeah. you had this. What actually went there, though? What actually, what, what was the issue there? Let's Because there was, was going to be a lot of people there who didn't it, know. It, what, that, what happened? After, after paying absolute false union medical bills and that, you don't get no help with them as well. You have to do it yourself. It turned out it was a smudged brain scan. A smudged brain scan kept me out of the ring for two years at the peak of my career, my money-making earning years. It was wow. it was bad, really, but it is what it is, and he had to be sure, you know what I mean? It turns out it was a smudged brain scan. Couldn't find what did they meaning. think it was initially, then? What what, what did they... Before, it was, uh, uh, I got a phone call off the board. I just finished sparring all happy. A week out from fighting Gamry, it felt like top, top shape, and that would have been an absolute top fighter, yeah, top would fighter and i was sure i was going to win i was i felt the best of my career i'd lost two fights and tried i didn't want to lose a third so i put everything into it and um, it just i got oh got a phone call that was it that was what i was saying with it and i got a phone call and after board go hi mate i went hi mate he goes right your fights off i went wow what's up with you wait looks like you've got a tumor on you on your brain on your brain i went what so you've got a tumor wow. on your brain so i'm like what am i am i gonna die and he went well we can't tie that over the phone maybe you need to go hospital today Go, goodbye, fucking fuck. I was like, trust me, I, I'm not ashamed to say, it. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I burst out into tears. I remember, I'm like, 
I put so much into the camp going into the Reese fight, and I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm Mike Mars looking after me at the side training manager and that. And I, yes. I, 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 so I've put me on the phone, told him what happened. And then I got in the car and I was fucking shell shocked. What well, you would be? I, I mean, what what you'd be and thinking? I cried. I cried all the way home from Leeds, yeah. all the way back to Manchester. I was trying to phone people like my mum, my brother, my best mates, and that, and say the fight's over. What what was happening? I was like, Ugh, I couldn't speak. I was fucking. I thought I was gonna die. Then I saw. Yeah, yeah. I thought fucking. Are man, they allowed to even baby. do that though? I mean, without it being a proper medical know, professional, I, like I tell you what. It was fucking bad how they did it. I fucking they went, get to, get I went, mate, I'm gonna die, but can't say that I'll get to the hospital today. I thought fuck hell. Jeez Shit, man. Christ. Fucking hell, so I, I went down, it took me another year getting my medical sort. It turns out it was a smudge brain scan, it fucked me right off, but it is what it is and that's what it is and it, it all makes you you are, doesn't it? I mean I've had a I've had a mad story, me. My life has just been a mad, mad Mad life, good life, entertaining with massive highs, but also massive, massive lows. But I'm at a little comfortable spot in my life now. I found, good man. I found happiness. I've got my business is going okay. I mean, COVID's not not sit on a little bit, but it's it's getting back to where it was before all that. It's getting there. I've got happiness with my missus Holly. We've got a baby on the way, and just things have just slowed down. Like my life was, I was compared to being like on on a riverboat on the rapids, going just trot tr- tr- like turbulent waters, constantly rocking all over. But I feel like I'm going into a nice little smooth patch of stream now. I can <laughs> just sit back, have my little cocktail, that with my yeah. shades on, and just relax. And that's what I want. And um, getting there. Bit by bit, we're getting there, and that's good. I'm happy. Good. And let's celebrate really your career. So, you, the highlight of your career uh, was when you fought Brandon Rios, um, which yeah. was when when I first got told, not that I got told, heard about that fight. Um, I was a young lad, and I was like, "Oh my god, these are two warriors!" Two, because you both were two absolute warriors going at it. I mean, talk yeah. us through talk us through that fight and how you felt the fight, the build up to the fight. Talk us through that. I loved every second of it, every moment of it. Um I really believed I still believe it now it's my destiny to win that world title. I believed it. I had a good camp and that and I was really there to win the fight. I mean on the fit I think the deciding factor in the fight for me was on the night of the fight Brandon Rios got in the ring and he was 12 stone and I got in the ring I was 10 stone 10 right. so I was giving away 18 pounds yeah, I know he, fa- he failed the weight and I got a bit of extra money but I watched the fight back and then when I watched the fight back I watched it a lot longer actually mm-hmm. and I still believe every every second I still dream about that fight now and in, in my dream I'm, it's like I'm still in the fight it goes oh you, you're not lost the fight John. it was just a dream you thought you lost you're in the right. fight you're going to win I thought oh I'm still going to win I'm still, I, still, I still believe in my destiny to win um, but go. I mean, I stood toe to toe with a man that was eighteen pounds. Every in boxing, you have weight divisions for a reason, mm-hmm. and uh, a good big and always beats a good little one. But it wasn't to be that night, and I am gutted because I watched the fight back, and I I think I was well in the fight. Me, I think it was a good good fight. I know my face started marking up, but I thought it was well in the fight. If you watched the fight, I stand toe to toe on the biggest punch in world boxing, and I fucking had it with him. And uh, <laughs> after the fight. After the fight, he's running around full of energy. I go backstage, have a little chat with him. And he's like, Murray, you're one tough son of a bitch. I've never fought nobody like that before. Fuck, you know, you're one tough son of a bitch. I love that. But then I heard that after the fight, he collapsed and got put in the back of an ambulance. And, uh, no way. Yeah, and then I don't know. Sometimes I think about the real fight. I think the next fight after me goes the weight division up and he knocks out. Uh, Danny Alvarez was it in two rounds and then the fight after that he goes away to division above that boxes Manny Pacquiao loses on points mm-hmm. and then fails a drug test and I thought an undefeated mm-hmm. fighter don't just start taking drugs and the fact that when he finished the fight he had low energy jumping around the ring but then half an hour later he's collapsed backstage and I thought whatever he was on had worn off and that's how I, right. I feel like I robbed, him, I robbed him of glory in the fight it can never be. It'll never come out. You never know the truth. But do you think he was what... though? I mean, if if someone let's say had a gun to your head and said, you know, it was a yes or no, what would you pick? I don't know. I've heard I've heard little things. I don't I don't know. You can never know. People talk, don't they? Mate, it it don't really matter anyway now because 
the fight's been and gone and I lost my fight and that was that. But I did feel it was my destiny. And I do think if he was a lightweight on that day, I'd have beaten any lightweight in the world. I felt, yeah. I felt really good. I was sharp. Even in the fight, I thought, I'm going to win this fight. I remember being around six, seven, thinking, this is my night. I'm going to win the fight. I felt like everything was going well, punching well. I thought, this is my night. I'm going to be world champion. And I, was, I felt so sweet. I was like, feel like the, I could feel like the excitement in my back. I thought, fucking, I'm going to win. I know I'm going to win. It was mad. And then I didn't win in the end, but I had it with him all the way through. I didn't get knocked down. On, but so you smart me up, my own wrist blocking. I a bit of yeah. slam my defense off, but my defense I thought was really good. Uh, peekaboo. But if you you set a little bone there on your wrist, uh-huh. you bang that bone against that bone in your cheek all the way through a fight, bang, bang, bang. My eyes used to puff up from the bottom, always blocking. Uh-huh. And it puffed up. And that's what used to cause all the damage. Um, that and plus my nose block because I couldn't block an uppercut. It was going boom. <laughs> <laughs> I never got taught how to block an uppercut. Yeah, yeah. So you just never get to... Together. It's mad, you know, that kind of stuff is mad that you say. It's British fighters. Now, I've I've got friends all over and I, I, I've actually commentate now and I commentate over here in the UK. I commentate out in America and I've got um, friends who are brought from, over from America. Top, top fighters. He's, um, I think he's the... Uh, WBC North American Bridgeweight Champion now, and uh, I brought him over to the UK and I brought him over to to spar with some of our best middleweight lads. Um, and he was, I think he was a light heavyweight, something like that, um, super middleweight. And he said, you know, it's mad that how many things we don't get taught here in Europe or the UK. You know, like the, your inside game and stuff like that. You're one of the few who could, but we don't get taught that, do you, in the amateurs? You just get it all. Keep it long. Keep stop. it long. It's weird. I would go by saying everything I learned in boxing was self-taught. I mean, boxing trainers that I was involved with were all conditioners. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and you learn through sparring. You know what I mean? If you if you move a certain way, you get caught with a shot, you think, I better not do that again. So I think most of the top fighters in the country are all self-taught. Yeah. I think the reason why the standard of boxing is getting better is because instead of being conditioned off fighters and fighters teaching themselves, I think you're getting ex-pros now getting involved with the game. And that yeah. I work with my business, sit and talk to him. Um, I talk to him about different ways of throwing things. And I, I try and teach him how I used to box. And, and I show him things that I used to do and show what worked for me. And um, I think you've got better coaches teaching, teaching kids yeah. actually out to box instead of the kids just fighting. And learning as they go. Yeah, rather than being like a glorified PT, pretty much. Because you did get them, didn't you? And you still do. Well, I think boxing is flooded with it at yeah. the minute. Um, when I look at the actual trainers, I don't think I ever worked with anyone who was an actual boxer. I'll tell you what, I'll take that back. I'll give Ron McCracken his credit where he's credit. He was an actual boxing trainer. He's an ex-professional boxer. I remember him sitting down and talking to me. And trying to teach me things, I'm trying to be smarter about my boxing. So I did like camps down like Lewis College with him sparring, Billy Corcoran, Lee Meager, them type of people in there. I remember him actually trying to teach me how to box. And I think, you know what it was? I was trained by Joe Gallagher, who's conditioning. Joe was very good at making me. So he don't listen to anyone else, only listen to me. And he was a bit brainwashed by the way Joe was because mm-hmm. you'd look at him and you listen to everything he said and it make you not. What I even talk to anyone else, you know what I mean? He'd say, Don't talk to them, you know, he, he may not want to talk to anyone. Everything I say is right, and everyone, everyone else is wrong, and that's the way he was. But you listen to him. But I remember Rob trying to get into me a little bit, like teach me actually how to box rather than because I box with a box like trying to go through people all the time. Yeah, but yeah, like, my boxing skills, if you look at the early, I've got videos of me earlier in my career, I'm, I'm like, bum, 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 quick punches, stepping around. Uh, switching southpaw, boxing out of two stances and stuff like really slick, quick boxer. But I just got into the routine of fighting this style instead of using technique. I thought I'm bigger, stronger. I was walk through because I had that ability. I was super duper strong in there. I was super duper fit. And I just thought, fuck this, I'm just going to walk through it. And I did. And it, 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 boxing started getting a bit too easy for me because I started walking through people too easily. 
you know, as they developed and yeah. stuff. And I thought, I thought this could be the thing anyone. Is when you get up to a certain level, that's when things can change quite quickly. But so you said about the thirty-one fights you had unbeaten, which is a huge, really. I mean, that's got to be <laughs> one of the biggest, uh, you know, for thirty-one uh, fights undefeated, unbelievable, still in debt, unbelievable, <laughs> it's, still mad. In debt. it's crazy, not a joke. Not of them, thirty-one fights though. Um, who was you know what was your toughest fight of them thirty-one? It's so tough. My, my tough fights like won't any of my losses, won't probably any of my title fights. The tough fights for me were earlier on in my career. So I always talk about fighting Money or Gwe Bass. I think it was about my twelfth fight, something like that. He was a French man. I was nineteen, and he was just a strong, tough fit man. He went eight rounds, and uh, it's tough learning experience, keeping it together, not falling apart, it's going into the trenches. It was a tough, tough fight, and um, and then like another another fight when I boxed for WBC Youth World Title in Alexandra Palace down London. I can't remember what a kid was called, but boxing African. It went ten rounds the first time, went ten rounds again. Only young, twenty, twenty-one, something like that. And they was hard fights because I'm a boy and I'm fighting big, strong men. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I'm I mean, learning the trade. You're not fully what, grown, are you, at that stage? That's, 18, what, that's what was tough for me. It was a tough learning fight for me. And that's what stood me in good stead when you're in a fight. By the time I'm getting to title fights, I was I was a pretty complete fighter. Yeah. Um. So if I wanted to rest, I'd rest. I could stay safe. If I wanted to work, I could work. If I didn't want to get it, I wouldn't get it. And uh, and it, they, even though even though some of them fights I lost, I, I would say the reason I lost the fight is because I, I fucked about outside training and that. I started getting sick of boxing. Um, I like to say I was 31 fights und, und, undefeated and I was still driving in like a nine-year-old green feet punto. Um, I still I still owed masses amount of money out. I was about 24 grand in debt by this point. Yeah. I'm like, what do I have to do? to make money and I seen kids I started looking over my shoulder too much I seen kids on nine fights driving Mercedes and that I was like because oh, he can drive Mercedes I've got a nine I've got a nine year old green feet up coming over for some time <laughs> you know what I mean and it started start getting sick of it I thought what do I have to do and it, it dawned on me it thought no matter how many times I win my hard fights I have I'm never ever going to make any money out of boxing I, I just knew that and I might have been wrong maybe for one of the next five fights or ten fights Maybe I've spotted one or all. Maybe I've made a million quid, but I highly doubt it. I highly, <laughs> highly doubt it. Uh, I don't know why that is, because I see other kids come through and they've had 17 fights and they're like, fighting for world titles, a millionaires, yeah. but my path was never that way. I don't know why. I think I had certain pro, I had no promoter. I was fighting on club shows here, there and everywhere. And, um, it just, it, it, it wasn't my destiny. I think for my first fight, I got a thousand pounds, which is... Um, which is good money now compared to what fighters get these days. Although if you find on club shows, I think most of them want ticket deals, which is bad for boxing because I don't think a pro a pro boxer should ever get in the ring without getting paid. And if you're on ticket deals, sometimes you don't sell enough tickets. You um, you pay your promoter, you pay your opponent, mm -hmm. and if you haven't sold enough tickets, you get nothing. I mean, my brother Joe, I train him for fights sometimes on Steve Wood shows. And we didn't sell enough tickets. And uh, he pays his opponent two, three grand. He pays Steve Wood his cut. And then Joe would end up fighting for like fucking 30 quid, 40 quid sometimes. I'd say, wow. well, let's get the rounds in, you know what I mean? But yeah, fucking yeah. Pro, a pro boxer fighting for fucking 40 quid, it's not fucking right, you know what no. I mean? And something probably needs to be done about that as well. I agree. Um, you're a throwback fighter. You you always have been. You know you you're there for business. You aren't there mess about or tickle. Um, how does it make you feel to when you see, you know, some of these Love Islanders and these YouTubers come to, the, you know, the boxing market and make like daft money? I mean, how does that make you feel? It is what it is. There's nothing we can do about it. I mean, it's, this is the era we're living. I genuinely say this to my mates all the time. I said I'm. I'm fucking not from this area. Me, I should have been born. If I was sixty-two now, if I was thirty years, thirty years old, or something like that. Yeah. If I was, I would just be so much happier. If I was sixty-seven now, thirty years older, I'd be so much happier. I think my life's coming to an end now, but I've lived my life. I don't like the times we're living. If I'm honest, it's not for me. I think it's too much fucking. It's all bullshit. I just think I don't feel like men are men anymore. Me, do you know what I mean? Like, it's just so fucking. I don't know. 
I can't really put my finger on what it is, what I don't like you know about what, the right. zero. I completely I don't agree. Like it. I completely yeah, I agree, do. mate. I don't like it. I, just, I don't like the people. I don't like the snidiness. Everyone just fuck you. I don't I don't like the times we live in me. I think I wish I was born thirty years earlier. Because yeah. I tell you what, I'd be happier. I yeah. like when men was men. And you know what it is with, <laughs> back then? I've, I my agree impression completely. Is, my impression is back then it is a problem. Two men have a problem. Let's yeah. in the booze is a problem. Go, come on, let's go outside. We'll have a little scrap. That's what my dad tells me. So we'll have a scrap and we'll go back in and have it together. Oh, Fight each other a pint and shake yeah, hands. Yeah, that's how it used to be. But now yeah. it's all like snide little comments on on Facebook and yeah. people bitching behind each other's backs. And I think men have become women, man. Why are <laughs> men like women now? And it annoys me. Mate, I think. I was I was talking to my missus the other day about this. Um and about you know like modern relationships. Um, yeah, um, she said she's like I'm, I'm so happy that we've been we've been together like 10 years now she's like nice. I'm so happy like we've been married in so long it's like because now if you go on Love Island then you're not you not you don't you don't see someone like you did before I was like what are you on about you don't see someone it's like well at first you're just talking to him I was like right she's like and then you're something else and you're, you're something else then you're something else then you're exclusive but that means you're not together and I was like, what the fuck? Oh, it's bullshit. It's like, what? Yeah. It's, you know, it's my, back in our day, was, hey, Doc, you're right. You're pretty fit. Shall we go on a, on a date? Get on well. Well, we're going to be together for a bit now. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. how easy it yeah, was yeah. when we were young. We were young. Yeah. But uh, it is yeah. mental, it is. But like I say, you see, the, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing for boxing, though, the likes of something like Jake Paul? Because it, it is bringing new audiences in, isn't it? It's bringing new audiences in. It's bringing money into the sport. I mean, Think what you want of him, but he's he's a smart businessman, isn't he? And it's a shame though that someone like that he wasn't earned his right his right of passage. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some fighters like myself had to had to earn had to go through tough tough fights and tough tough times in tough tough gyms. I mean, when you're 15 years old and you walk into a gym for the first time, everyone's eyes turn and stay if you use this new kid, and it's intimidating. It's scary. <laughs> And you know what? I'm not going to lie. You're what beat fuck out you. Yeah. That's what it's like. Because I remember what I said about boxing. Respect is earned. It's not given. So you just walk into a gym and everyone respects you straight away. No. It's earned. And you have to earn it the hard way by taking the blows and coming back and showing that you, you're game enough to take the blows and still come back and that. And that's how you earn your respect in the boxing gym. But once you earn your respect in that gym, you're a part of that gym family then. And Forever. it's you against the world. Yeah, yeah. It's For you life. against the world. Yeah. Is, yeah, for yeah, life. Completely I've agree. got friends from my first box gym, 14 years old, not seen for years. But it's when we do it. see it, it's like, how are you doing, John? How are you yeah. doing? How are you doing, me? And we're talking that it's lifelong friends. You make lifelong yeah. friends. That's what I'm saying. Boxing should be brought back into schools because I tell you what, it's all, it's all all this nonsense for me. Yeah, I completely agree. And what is it? So you said about your gym, what you're doing now. So tell us tell us about what you're doing, you know, a little bit more. Well, yeah, now you're not boxing. I've got a gym over in Stockport. Um, Stockport Town Centre. Um, I do personal training, keep fitting um, classes, amateur boxing, uh, keep fit classes. Hey, I just I, I work long there. And I'm, I'm putting the hours in and I'm putting the effort in as well. It's doing well. It's getting there bit by bit. COVID. I had another gym over in Reddish before Stockport, and after COVID, it shut my gym down for a year, and then the landlord sold the building. And then I had to take my gym out and put it into storage and find somewhere new. But um, I managed that in Stockport. I've started a new gym. It's getting there bit by bit. I mean, I'm getting charged a fortune for rent off my landlord, which is a bit annoying for me because at the minute I'm working, but I'm giving him a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the money I make. So it's leaving me a little bit to live on. And I'm spending about thirty quid a day in petrol at the minute. It's really God. fucking me off, you. But <laughs> how comes people aren't striking? I remember like. When I was in the 90s or whatever, fucking lorries are uh, blocking up the motorways and that when they put petrol yeah, yeah. to like 30p a litre. Like, now it's £2 a litre. No one's asked. No, it's nobody like, cares. It's weird, isn't it? Is that, how, how, how much money are you guys making, man? Because I'm putting 30 quid a day in the tank and it's fucking killing me. You know what I mean? Mental. But, um, Mental. Well, I just don't know what this, what these times are we living. It doesn't mean anything. This. I agree with you. And to be honest, you know, you absolutely lived up to what I expected to be. Um, I, I just really want to say is, you know, a massive thank you for all the memories. Um, you're an incredible yeah. fighter. You're clearly, clearly incredible guy. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. Not a problem, mate. Thanks for having me. I do appreciate.